I'm Anika and I, I work in, in, in Fusion. Um, on our first slide here, we've got a picture of the, of the sun because that's the, the biggest example of a fusion reactor that we have. So there inside the sun, there's loads and loads of fusion reactions going on. And like Joe mentioned previously, we're trying to recreate um, the sun on Earth. So pretty simple, really. Um, hopefully my slides can click through. OK, so the problem, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, is that at the moment, more than 80% of our energy is coming from fossil fuels. Um, so you can see here, this is from the IEA, the International Energy Agency, I want to say. I always get confused. I think it's International Energy Agency. Um, and they've got the total global energy supply here, and more than 80% of that is coming from fossil fuels. In the UK, it's a little bit better, but it's still not great, especially for heating. So you can see here, we've got a slightly greater share of nuclear, um, but still, uh, most of the you know, energy mix for heating is still coming from, from fossil fuels. Um, so we need to stop burning fossil fuels uh, for transport and for heating, and we need to be moving to using electricity instead. And we need more carbon-free electricity generation. So I'm sure you're all aware of the re renewables. You can see wind turbines. A lot of houses these days have solar panels and stuff on top of their houses. Um, they're going to play a huge part in this. But we also need something that's not weather dependent. Um, and why do I talk about this? I'm just going to explain in the next slide. So um, I took the UK's kind of electricity supply from a date a few weeks ago, 28th of March. And I'm sure you'll remember there was a, a period of time where it was very, very windy in the UK. Um, and on those days, we we're actually getting more than 50% of our electricity supply was coming from wind. However, if we go to a few weeks later, when it wasn't so windy, that's dropped to less than 10%. And at the moment, what we use to fill that gap um, is gas. So around 50% of our electricity was coming from gas, which is really not acceptable if we want to be, uh, you know, meeting those climate targets that we've set and, you know, dealing with, with climate change. We need to have something that will provide a stable base load of, of energy, um, but not be dependent on the weather. And this, we hope, potentially, is where nuclear fusion um, could play a role in the future. So what is nuclear fusion? Fusion is literally where two ions kind of come together, combine and fuse. And that releases energy through uh, Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared. So when those two ions collide together, the mass of the products that are produced is less than the mass of the um, kind of initial reacting ions. And that mass loss is equivalent to energy, and that's energy that we can use. So on Earth, the most efficient fusion reaction that we hope to use for commercial energy production is the reaction between two uh, isotopes of hydrogen called deuterium and tritium. And we want to use that because they're just more likely to collide together compared to other fusion reactions within a similar energy range. When the deuterium and tritium collide together, they produce uh, helium um, and also a neutron, which is at a very, very high energy of 14 MeV. And when this energy is liberated, the hope is in the future, when we build a fusion reactor, that that can be transferred uh, to heat, which will uh, generate steam and drive a turbine, just like typical uh, reactors today in any other sector. It's, it's kind of the, the same principle. So what is the pathway to fusion power? So now I'm going to talk about kind of some big experiments that we're working on at the moment as a global fusion community and how hopefully towards the end of the century we can get to fusion power. So at the moment, we have two massive experiments um, among many, many others, but these are the two big ones um, that are running. One of them is called JET, so the Joint European Tourist, and that's located in Oxford. So a lot of our researchers here work together with them and they're doing research for another reactor that I'll come to in the next couple of slides uh, to test how do they control the fusion reaction, what materials they'll use. Um, so in the middle of the slide here, you can see this bright pink light here. Now this is a plasma, so that's where the fusion reaction is occurring. A plasma is basically a gas that's got really, really hot, and so it's it's been ionized, so it's split into the you know the negative parts and the positive parts of the of the atom, and those ions are colliding together, um, and that's where the fusion fusion is happening. So very very beautiful, and that's kind of you can see a person on the left hand side there. That's the scale of that reactor, and that's where a lot of really important experiments are being carried out. There's also another big reactor that's just come up and running in Japan called J260SA, which is doing similar types of experiments, testing things, testing materials, testing different configurations for the plasma as we go forward to a new device, 
called Ita. Now, Ita is in the south of France, beautiful weather, I uh, wish I was there. Um, and that's a huge, huge collaboration uh, between the European Union, uh, Russia, China, Japan, India, Korea. And I feel I may have, and did I say India? I can't remember, but there's seven, seven big collaborators uh, working together at ITER, trying to make the biggest ever uh, fusion reactor, biggest ever tokamak. So those are the two kind of reactors I've been before. They were also tokamaks, but this is gonna be even bigger. Uh, and ITA is being built to show that we can use fusion in the future um, as a viable source of energy to prove that we can get more energy out than we put in, which hasn't been proven before uh, in any of the smaller experiments we've done. Um, so they want to prove that. They also want to prove other technologies such as tritium breeding. So as I mentioned before, the kind of fuels that we're looking at are deuterium and tritium. Now, deuterium we can extract from seawater. Tritium, uh, it's kind of limited in supply. At the moment, we're getting small bits and bobs from, from nuclear fission reactors, so from can-do reactors is where we get our tritium from. But the hope is in the future that from the neutrons that we generate in the fusion reaction itself, those neutrons can interact with lithium to generate more tritium. So not only will our reactor be, the, you know, be able to generate energy, but we can also use it to generate the fuel that we will need as well, which is a really exciting bit of, of research that's going on. So ITER is hopefully going to be proving all of these things. Um, but one thing to remember is that ITER is not going to be generating electricity. It's not going to be putting electricity on the grid. So following ITER, which hopefully will have its first plasma in 2025, uh, we'll test all of the, you know, the technology, the materials, etc. And then we'll go on to a demonstration fusion reactor called DEMO. And there's always already um, work being done to design the components, design things for this demonstration fusion reactor. So following ETA, that plan is to, to build demo and actually demonstrate we can put electricity on the grid from fusion. So that's probably quite a while away. But there are some other kind of more like disruptive type technologies going on uh, and other things that are happening in parallel, which I'll move on to now. So the first big one, which has recently been announced, is the spherical to tokamak for energy production, which is the UK Atomic Energy Authority program in the UK, um, where they want to build a prototype reactor by 2040. So they want to have a kind of a smaller uh, tokamak, a spherical tokamak, and they're working really, really hard with universities like Manchester uh, to try and prove that you know fusion is viable going forward. So that's a really, really exciting and really current piece of uh, research that's going on. There's also recently been a huge, huge number of uh, companies coming into the mix as well. So previously, Fusion has been pretty much lab-based, research-based, university-based. But as the technology progresses and we're moving forward, um, there's a lot of companies that are trying to prove Fusion can work as well. So we've got companies like General Fusion in Canada, First Light Fusion and Tokamak Energy in the UK, also TLE Technologies. Uh, Commonwealth Fusion Systems, among many others. And there's even a fusion industry association now as well. So things are really progressing rapidly and it's a really exciting time um, to be in fusion. I'm going to talk about a couple of them very, very quickly, um, which is Tokamak Energy and also Commonwealth Fusion Systems, who are working together with MIT in America. These two companies are actually pioneering technology in uh, high temperature superconductors, which could be a game changer in um, bringing more compact devices that are smaller and more uh, quick to deploy, basically. So their kind of big selling point is that they'll be able to have smaller reactors. So ITER, you saw the picture, is huge. They've got super cool superconductors that they're using at the moment. Whereas these companies are trying to use the high temperature ones, which allow for, for a, smaller, a smaller reactor. So I've talked about the exciting uh, pathway that we've got to fusion power, but obviously we're not there yet. And there's a lot of challenges um, that researchers are working on. Uh, so I'm just gonna go through those quickly now and, and summarize them. So the first one is, is the plasma, which I mentioned before, the ionized gas, how we can find that, how we control that, the different configurations that we're using. That's a huge area of research that's going on. Then we also have the magnetic field that I mentioned. So how they're, they're used to confine the plasma. We use magnets to make sure that it stays in that reactor. Um, so developing those either superconducting, uh, super cool superconducting magnets or high temperature superconducting magnets, huge area of research that's going on. Then I also have mentioned already the fuel. So we have deuterium and tritium and doing the research in how we can breed tritium in the reactors, different kind of 
um, designs for the breeding of tritium is another huge, huge area of research. And also, we don't want to have retention of fuel in our components because that will uh, create some radioactive waste and we don't want that. So that's another area of research in terms of the fuels. There's also huge, huge advances in robotics going on because of fusion. We need to be able to do remote handling of components, changing components remotely because we can't go into a reactor when there's, uh, you know, a plasma going on in there. So kind of like robotics research is really picking up, um, which is really exciting kind of area of research in, in fusion. Then we have a lot of materials challenges. So I showed a picture of the sun um, at the beginning of our talk. Um, to make fusion happen on Earth, we actually need temperatures 10 times hotter than the sun. Uh, so it's around 100 million degrees Celsius in the plasma in the center of, of you know, our reactor. Um, and then if you imagine in ITER, you've got 100 million degrees in the center, and then you've got these super, super cool superconducting magnets at the side, which are almost absolute zero. So in the space of a few meters, you're going from almost absolute zero to 100 million degrees. There's nowhere else in the universe that has such a steep temperature gradient. Um, and then top of that, you have the neutrons generated uh, as well. So really big material challenges, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail on the next slide, because that's what I'm interested in, really on where a lot of the research at Manchester is, is going on. And then one that people don't really talk about is kind of the regulation side of things. So fusion is a new industry. So even if we do crack all the technical challenges and we build a fusion reactor tomorrow, there's going to need to be regulations and stuff that are in place so that it's ready to go. The nuclear fission industry is really heavily re regulated, but that those regulations won't be the same for fusion because we have a lot of different challenges. So putting that framework in place is a huge area of research that's kind of picking up at the moment as we move closer and closer to commercial viability. So as I promised, I'll talk a bit more specifically about the, the materials issues, which is where a lot of the work at, at Manchester is looking at. Um, so the first one that I mentioned, I know Jesse Lingard has just gone on loan to West Ham, but I can think of another famous number 14. So uh, we have those 14 MeV neutrons, really energetic. They're created, you can imagine them like a snooker ball, really, and they can hit your, your materials. And if you imagine all the other atoms in your materials, the snooker balls hit, but the snooker balls, you get cascades that causes damage. Um, can those materials cope with that damage? Will they stay structurally sound and safe? Um, massive area of research that's going on in moment, at the moment because it can change the material properties. Then, as I mentioned before, we're very, very hot, very high temperature. So dealing with those heat loads, we need materials that can cope with them. Fortunately for us, it's not 100 million degrees at the walls of the reactor, that's only in the center of the plasma. But we're still talking thousands of degrees um, at those walls and how those materials cope with those high heat temperatures is really, really important. And we're doing a lot of work uh, to look at that. The other one uh, that's really important is that in fusion, we don't want to have a lot of radioactive waste. We want our materials, um, we don't want to generate long lived radioactive waste. So that kind of limits the materials that we can uh, use actually, because certain materials are out of the question because they would become radioactive. So we've made this kind of pledge that we want to use reduced activation materials. Um, so we like to make things even more difficult um, for ourselves as well. The next one is the, the helium that's generated from the fusion reaction. That also can interact with materials that can generate bubbles, blisters, nanostructures on the surface. Um, so, for example, I work with tungsten, uh, and when that interacts with those helium uh, plasmas, um, the surface of the tungsten can turn black because this um, nanostructure called fuzz is formed. So, if you can imagine, we're producing a black metal. Uh, so, it's like the darkest man made metal, which might be a problem in fusion, but could, that actually could be really. Um, applicable to other industries. So similar to what Phil was talking before, cross-disciplinary work is really important. So one man's um, trash is another man's treasure. So there's talk of that maybe being cool for um, splitting of water or for solar panels and phot photovoltaics as well. Um, so yeah, very, very interesting. And then just more generally, just the interactions of the plasma with the materials, what influence that has. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, the high magnetic field. So what materials can we use to generate those high magnetic fields to control that plasma and contain that plasma? Um, and also, how does that magnetic field affect the other materials we're using in the reactor as well? That's another area of research. So in ETA, for example, we're talking about magnetic fields of around 13 Tesla. Now, if you compare that to a PET scanner in the hospital, which is 1.5 Tesla, which is already considered very, very high, um, really significant magnetic fields. So the influence of that, again, another really key area. 
uh, for materials uh, research. So in summary, at the top, I hope people have seen Iron Man, um, but that, that is the fantasy of fusion. That's what we're looking for, that we'll have a fusion reactor. Please don't ask me when we'll have fusion. That's always the joke, everyone's back, it's always 30 years away. But I actually genuinely do believe that we are getting there. There's been a real change since I've started in the in the field, and I've noticed a real, you know, picking up of of, of uh, kind of development. Uh, so I do hope towards the end of the century we, we will have uh, kind of viable fusion. In the middle, we have a big detailed design of of ITER. Um, that's the less less fantasy. That's what we're working on at the moment, designing all of these fusion reactors, working on the research for the materials and and the physics side of things. And then at the bottom, you've got the reality. So that's a slightly older picture, um, but you can see the tokamak pit there at the bottom as well. So that's why I put that picture in, because now it's all covered up and you can't really see much. Um, but that's being built right now, and hopefully they will have their first plasma in 2025. Um, but yeah, so fusion is very exciting, and I hope it will play a role in our carbon-free future. <laughs>